So those of you who were here last Sunday, you are aware that this is like, like a general title for the series, Christianity 2019. And as a teacher of God's Word, I consider this series very important because, dear friends, it is aimed at causing us to rethink our understanding of Christianity. This series is aimed at causing us to rethink. You see, when, when you say, I'm a Christian, what, what does it really mean? Or what's it supposed to mean? So this series of sermons is aimed at causing us to rethink that. So last Sunday, our sermon was about conversion, understanding conversion. That's part one of the series. And I have mentioned in that sermon last Sunday that if you went home remembering only one thing, here was our take-home, take-away slide last Sunday. If you remember only one thing from last sermon, this is it. Conversion equals repentance and Faith. The gist was, while we maintain that we are saved by grace through faith, meaning it is by believing alone that we are saved, not by works. Amen? We, we know that. Yes, we maintain that. We teach that it's just by believing that a person is saved. Yes, we maintain that. But what we learned last Sunday was true saving faith needs to be qualified. What that means is that true saving faith has a certain biblical quality. When we say we believe, friends, in order for that belief to be a saving kind of faith, in order for that belief to be a saving kind of believing in the gospel that was preached by Jesus Christ, it requires a certain quality. And that quality is repentance. When a person claims to believe, but there is no evidence of a desire to repent, friends, according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that person's claim to faith is questionable. Conversion equals repentance and faith. That was from last Sunday. At this point, I want to request our servers to serve coffee. Yes, there's free coffee tonight. It's, uh, maybe you're thinking, oh, is it a new MPBC thing? So I will allow enough time for our servers to uh, to serve coffee, and in the meantime, you can chat with your, chat with your friends, and just say thank you for coming tonight. If you haven't greeted them, uh, Happy New Year yet. This is the second Sunday. Don't wait until third Sunday <laughs> for you to greet our brothers and sisters. Uh, Happy New Year, and of course, that's our way of desiring God's best for them this new year. So coffee is being served. Feel free to, to drink it. Don't wait for every. It's not communion. <laughs> just, just go ahead and drink it. It's courtesy of, courtesy of Maui Philippine Baptist Church. And thank you ladies for for being willing to, to do that. Everybody had a cup? It's a small cup. Cheers. Please enjoy the coffee. You can go ahead and drink it all. Thank you, your dear MPBC ladies. I have an honest question. What do you think about the coffee? Honestly, honestly, make a review. Make a review. <laughs> make a review of the coffee. Both. 
Cold. Thank you for your honest answers. It's not a knock on our ladies. Actually, the, the room temperature coffee was intentional. It serves as a jumping board to our sermon tonight. And it's entitled, Understanding Lukewarmness. It's part two of our current sermon series. Maybe you were thinking, what kind of coffee is this? It's our sermon number two of our ongoing series. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and then jump all the way to verse 20. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Please don't spit out the coffee. We are, <laughs> we'll be liable for staining the carpet. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. We jump to verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. It's time for a little background. Notice it's Revelation. We are in Revelation chapter 3. In the opening chapters, in the opening part of the book of Revelation, so the book of Revelation is the very, very last book of the Bible. Especially in chapters 2 and 3, we, if you go there, you will read some letters. Actually, seven letters. Those were actual letters from Jesus Christ. Those were letters that were addressed to seven churches. Those, we have a map here, and those uh, squares with, with crosses there are the locations of the churches that, were, that received a message from Jesus Christ. One letter for each church. Each letter contains an assessment of Jesus Christ. Each letter contained an evaluation of Jesus Christ of how each church was doing. The focus of our sermon tonight is the seventh church, the church in Laodicea. Tonight, I invite you, I invite us all to take a look deeper look at Jesus' message to the Laodicean church. It's right there, the bottom part of the map there. And I hope that we can go home after the worship service tonight being able to apply that message upon ourselves. Let's go back to verse 15 and 16. I know your deeds. This is Jesus speaking. This is the content of the letter to the church in Laodicea. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I want us all to just focus on that highlight there in red, that phrase there. Friends, there is a severe warning that's issued by Jesus Christ himself to the church. The church in Laodicea is in danger of being spat out from the mouth of Jesus. Which brings us to a very sad conclusion, dear friends, that the church in Laodicea was an unsaved church. Shocking. 
But our conclusion comes from the very judgment of Jesus himself. Jesus was threatening to spit out the church. In other Bible versions, the word is not spit. The word is even more severe, vomit. Jesus was threatening to to vomit the church out of his mouth. In our way of saying it in English, when you want to vomit, how do you feel? You feel sick. Laodicea was a church that made Jesus sick. Laodicea was a church that made Jesus feel like vomiting. So our question now is, What made Jesus condemn this church? That's our question tonight. What made Jesus condemn this church? Verse 16 again, especially that highlighted phrase there. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The problem, dear friends, of the church in Laodicea was lukewarmness. The church was lukewarm, very much like your coffee earlier. If you go to Starbucks, there are only two kinds of coffee at Starbucks. There are many flavors, many flavors, many add-ons, but there are only two kinds of Starbucks coffee, hot and cold, very hot and ice cold, nothing in between. Because a lukewarm room temperature coffee is disgusting for real coffee lovers. You know, Jesus felt the same way towards the Laodicean church. According to him, their problem was they were neither hot nor cold. And the condemnation pronounced by Jesus, that condition was disgusting. So disgusting, it made Jesus want to vomit them out. So let's consider this word, lukewarm. What's wrong with lukewarm? This is our favorite brand, Tiger. Everyone has has one of these at home, a rice cooker. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced your rice being spoiled in the rice cooker. Everyone, maybe, everyone. Well, we, we, we have at home, at least. Question, when does the rice spoil? When it's lukewarm. If the rice is very cold, like inside the refrigerator, it does not spoil. It doesn't spoil. If it's really smoking, steaming hot, it doesn't spoil. But when it cools down to that just just warm, a little bit sweating temperature, lukewarm until room temperature, that is when it begins to spoil. Question, why? What causes it? It starts with letter B, back T, bacteria. Bacteria, dear friends, bacteria love lukewarm temperatures. I, I went to college for microbiology, and bacteria multiply rapidly in lukewarm temperatures. You go to the North Pole and leave your hamburger there, it will not spoil. Why? Because it's so cold, bacteria get frozen. But you go to a tropical place like Hawaii, you go to a warm place like the Philippines, foods there spoil easily because of that just right temperature for bacteria. And when bacteria multiply, spoilage occurs. And when you eat spoiled food, what happens? You get sick. You get food poisoning. The Laodiceans were neither hot nor cold in relation to God, dear friends. They were just lukewarm. On one end of the spectrum, hot water is good. Hot water is useful. In one end of the spectrum, you can cook your 
your spicy noodle in the in hot water. You can cook your lucky me in hot water. But cold, really ice cold water, why, why is cold ice cold water good? It refreshes you. But somewhere in between, just imagine if you left your bottle of water inside your car for a day. Try to drink that. That's Laodicean water. And in our Lord's estimation, lukewarm water was good for nothing. Now, according to Jesus, the people in the church in Laodicea was like their water. This is the sad yet very convicting symbolism here, dear friends. Jesus, you know, Jesus wasn't calling the Laodicean church less sincere. No, he wasn't calling them less sincere. Jesus wasn't calling them, oh, they, you just lack, lack in, a little bit in commitment. Jesus wasn't saying, dear friends, oh, Laodicean church, you just need to get a little bit more excited. Or Laodicean church, you just, you just need a little bit more fire. No, Jesus wasn't saying that. Dear friends, what Jesus was saying, he was pronouncing a shocking declaration and judgment against the church in Laodicea. Jesus said, the church in Laodicea, they were not Christians at all. They were unsaved. They were, in fact, according to Jesus' estimation, they were unbelievers. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. In other words, dear friends, a lukewarm Christian is not a Christian at all. Again, if there's only one thing that you will remember tonight, I hope this is the slide. This is our, like, our one take-home slide tonight. If you remember only one slide tonight, this is it. A lukewarm Christian is not a Christian at all. Wow. You might say, Pastor, that seems to be like a like really harsh words. But friends, I'm not making these things up. This is Jesus' very own judgments. And the Bible used the example of the loudest saints in order to bring us a convicting lesson. So now let's properly understand lukewarm. I believe, I hope that this, even as we are beginning this, this sermon, it's already beginning to speak to you. Let's begin to understand this word here, lukewarm. What then is to be spiritually lukewarm? Because, dear friends, this is very critical. We need to have a proper understanding of this principle because it's so bad, Jesus condemns it harshly. Being lukewarm has eternal implications for all of us. It will determine where we are going to spend our eternity. And as a pastor, it's my calling to preach to you God's words and God's truth. So we ask, what made, what made the Laodiceans lukewarm? What caused the Laodiceans to be lukewarm? Verse 17, because you say... I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Dear friends, according to Jesus, this is what made the Laodiceans lukewarm. Their problem was they thought they were okay. That's, that's what verse 17 is teaching us. They were saying, I am rich. I, am, I have become wealthy. We have become wealthy. We don't need anything. Let's study those statement, statements a little bit. What do they mean here when they say, I am rich. I have become wealthy. I have need of nothing. Dear friends, what we see here is that the Laodiceans had an attitude of self-sufficiency. So in application, who are those who are lukewarm? Who are those? How can we know? 
are we, are we lukewarm? How can we know who are those who are lukewarm? Dear friends, first, the lukewarm, lukewarm people are those who claim to know God but live as though God does not exist. They have an idea of their religion. They believe in a kind of religion. They practice a form of religion, and then they conclude, ah, I think that's, that's good enough. That should be good enough. You know what, dear friends? This kind of mentality is spiritually dangerous. When we think we are okay, when we think we have enough religion in us, when we think that we are Christians because we are practicing just enough religion, but then we go our way every day without even thinking of Christ. Who are the lukewarm? Verse 17 again. I'm going to go back and go back, come back to verse 17 uh, all through this sermon. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. What made them lukewarm? It is their material sufficiency. What did they say again? What did the Laodicean people or church members say about themselves? They declared, I am, we are rich. We have become wealthy. We have need of nothing. Meaning, dear friends, they declared themselves to be self-sufficient. And as a result, they did not need God. Let's read Proverbs 30, verse 9, the first part of that verse. It says, For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Friends, the Bible tells us there's something about sufficiency that does something to the human soul. When we have everything, there's something about sufficiency. Even, even just the feeling of being sufficient, it dulls our need for God. The feeling of sufficiency, it dulls our need of God. You don't have to be actually rich. All you need to be is just to have everything you need. You're not worrying about food you're not worrying about shelter. You're not worrying about clothes to wear. And that's America, dear friends. That's America. We don't, we don't worry about food. There's lots of food. In fact, food just spoils. We throw away food. We don't worry about shelter. We don't, we don't worry about clothes to wear. We just have everything that we need. And in the words of Laodiceans, the Laodiceans, they said, they have a need of Nothing. As a result, they have become lukewarm. So who are the lukewarm? Who are the lukewarm? Friends, here. The lukewarm are those who are self-satisfied and have no felt need for God. This is what happened to the Laodiceans. They were materially sufficient. They did not have a felt need for God. I have intentionally uh, highlighted this phrase here, no felt need for God. I wanted to make an emphasis on that phrase, felt need. By that, that phrase there, felt need, by that what I mean is an inner conviction, an inner truth and reality of a person's need for God. You know, everyone can have a theoretical need for God. Everyone, you know, meaning most people will not readily admit, will not readily say that they don't need God. Most people, everybody will, will theoretically say, ah, yeah, I need God. But what they have is just a theoretical need for God. But by the way people live, you will know if they really have a felt need for God. This is what happened to the Laodiceans. They did not feel. They, they, there's no deeper truth inside of them. There's no deeper reality inside of them that they indeed were needing God. As a result, they became lukewarm. 
And that made Jesus feel sick about them. Jesus said, I will vomit you out. Again, back to verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. The repetition here, dear friends, is intentional. Friends, not only were the Laodiceans materially sufficient, they were also spiritually sufficient. They did not just think that they were sufficient materially, that they had everything they needed, food, shelter, clothing, everything. They were rich materially. They did not only think that, they also thought that spiritually they were also sufficient. So who are the lukewarm? Dear friends, the lukewarm are those who are spiritually, not only materially, the lukewarm are those who are spiritually self-sufficient. They don't feel the need for a Savior. And I would say, dear friends, this is more dangerous than material sufficiency. Can we all just read this? statement here on the screen together really out loud one two three go the lukewarm are those who are spiritually self-sufficient they don't feel the need for a savior what does this statement mean friends allow me to explain this this is you know this is the danger in many churches today there's a danger in many churches today in that there's a lack of an understanding of man's problem about sin. There's a lack of understanding of how sinful we are. There's a lack of understanding of how dirty we are. There's a lack of understanding of how filthy we are as people. And because of that lack of understanding, people, even people who call themselves Christians, there's a lack of a feel for that need for a Savior. In fact, we don't even feel like we needed to be even saved because we don't fully grasp the predicament that we are in, because we don't fully grasp how bad and how critical our situation is. Dear friends, I, I almost... I almost drowned when I was in college. It's an irony that the Lord has brought us here to Hawaii, and I don't know how to swim. So for eight years, the only, the only time I went to the water was for baptism, baptizing people. And I never really enjoyed the ocean. It looks so good. The waves look so good. But I cannot enjoy because I don't know how to swim. Back in college, sophomore, I think, I almost drowned in the ocean. And fortunately, there's this person that was beside me. We, we entered the ocean this way, so it was a gradual thing. We went, so I was okay as long as I have my feet on the bottom. I was okay. So we entered this way, and then I did not realize that we, we kind of moved this way, while we were out there, we moved this way. And then when it was time to come back to shore, we went in, back in this way, and I did not know what was happening in the bottom there. So over here was just a gradual thing, and I had my feet on the bottom, but over here there's this big, deep thing, and when I tried to look for the bottom, I was, I almost, I didn't know how to swim. So I was, I was, I was just sinking already. And beside me was my Bible study leader. And he never let go of me. That, that feeling of drowning, that feeling of wanting to breathe, and you breathe in salt water, I, I had, I felt in my deepest person that feeling of wanting to be saved. And so when he grabbed hold of me, I grabbed him back because I, I, I wanted to be saved. I was drowning. I knew my predicament. But he told me, let go of me, let go of me. I won't let go of him. 
Because I wanted to be saved. There's that feeling that I wanted to live. I was going to die. That, dear friends, is missing. This dimension is the thing that's missing in the consciousness of many people who call themselves Christians these days. We don't feel that need for a Savior. Because in a spiritual sense, we don't realize the predicament that we are in. We don't realize that we are drowning spiritually. We don't realize that because what we receive, what churches are receiving these days are our messages of God loves you. God will bless you. May the Lord just prosper you. Those messages are good, well and good. But friends, it misses out on the real purpose why Jesus Christ came. In fact, we do not feel like we needed to be even be saved because we don't fully grasp how bad and how critical, how drowning our situation is. Friends, the Bible warns us of a judgment day. I know it's a very unpopular topic. I know people will rather listen to topics like blessings, topics like peace. When you sent out your Facebook messages for the new year, what were your messages? Your, uh, your messages were, have a prosperous new year. Have a blessed new year. Have a peace-filled new year. Uh, we like those topics. It's the human nature. It's normal for the human nature. But dear friends, I want to tell you, Jesus did not come down from heaven for those things. Jesus came to earth to save us. To snatch us from drowning spiritually. Malachi the prophet warns us, surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. That, that's the message of Malachi in the Old Testament. Then John the Baptist echoed that in the New Testament. John the Baptist said, flee from the coming wrath. And then the Apostle Paul continued, he wrote in the book of Romans, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Dear friends, as pastor and teacher of God's Word, I want to echo what they preached. Judgment Day is a sure thing to happen. Revelation 20 describes, allow me to read to you a, a more vivid description of the Judgment Day. More details. Then I saw a great white throne, and on him was and him that was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Dear friends, there will be that day when you and I individually, we will stand before that throne. And the details that we find here in, ver in chapter 20 of Revelation, books will be opened. Books will be opened. Heaven is old school. They don't have an Apple laptop over there. It's still books. Books will be opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person, Bong Ronquillo, Albert Sim, James Sim, everybody, Bong Ronquillo, Rod Kim, every, each person was judged according to what they had done. The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. It continues in verse 15, that anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into 
the lake of fire. Friends, we are drowning. This is the predicament that we are in. Every, every human being needs to have a proper estimation of the predicament that he is in. There is a coming judgment. There is a lake of fire. You know what? This is the less emphasized portion of the gospel message. As a result, people don't have a proper understanding of how bad our situation is. And because of that, because people don't have a proper grasp or understanding of how bad their situation is, because of that, there's no real felt need for a Savior. Because people fail to grasp it, because people fail to realize how bad my situation is, I'm going to the lake of fire without Jesus Christ. I'm going there. I am condemned forever. People fail to realize that because churches nowadays, preachers nowadays, they don't emphasize that. But friends, that's, that's the less emphasized portion of the gospel message. So there's no really, there's no felt need for a Savior. Friends, we need to have that. We need to have that. The Laodiceans were like that, and they believed they were spiritually okay. There was no deep sense of sin. There was no sincere feeling of guilt. And so they became lukewarm. The result was lukewarmness. And Jesus pronounced a judgment upon them. I will spit you out. Meaning in Jesus' reckoning, they were not saved at all. Meaning in Jesus' reckoning, they were not Christians at all. And friends, in the light of the high stakes that are involved here, it's, it involves our eternity. It involves your eternity. I want to close with this sermon tonight by exhorting everyone, be prepared for the judgment day. Let's read verse 19 to 20. Those whom I love, again, this is part of Jesus' message to the church in Laodicea, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Does verse 20 sound familiar to you? Verse 20 is usually being used in evangelistic things, evangelistic uh, appeals for people to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. But friends, this is part of the letter to the people of the church in Laodicea. And by verse 20, you will know that that church wasn't saved at all. You will know by verse 20 where Jesus Christ is in relation to the church. Jesus was outside the door of the church. Meaning the church wasn't saved. Meaning that they had some religion. They thought they were Christians. They were called the church in Laodicea. But Jesus himself said, I am outside that church. And we can picture him. Or actually, he is picturing him being outside the door. He said, I am outside the door. I am knocking on your church. But verse 19 says, therefore, be zealous and repent. How can a guilty sinner have his name, her name, written in the book of life? How can a sinner be made right before the holy and righteous God to avoid God's wrath? Jesus gives a clear answer tonight, dear friends. Repent. Repent of our sins. Turn away from sin. Yes, we maintain. Yes, believe. But believe with that saving kind of belief. 
a belief that is evidenced by repentance. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, Father, for the message of Jesus to the church in Laodicea. Grant us the grace, O Lord, to to see ourselves under the same light. Help us. Help us not to fall in the same pit and trap. The trap and pit of feeling and thinking that we are doing okay. Father, I pray that you will just use your words that were preached tonight to speak to all of us. And I pray that your words will be like a double-edged sword that will pierce into the dividing of soul and spirit, that will pierce into the dividing between bone and marrow. Empower your words tonight. And I pray for your grace that we will respond with faith and repentance. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen and amen. Mm -hmm.